Ladies on the power pimp. All right, give it up for him, ladies. Give it up. All right, Miss Dr. Keita Joy. Receipts, 
That's what we do, right? 70 to 80% growth in the past 10 years. We have grown by 70 and 80%. In Florida, for those of my um, Floridians that are here, we were in the top three for African-American oh, businesses, women, right? And we have been coined the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. That's some girl power. Let's just, let's take a moment. This is where it gets real though, okay? So, and, and, I, and at some point maybe Christina can weigh in on this. There has been back and forth, African-American women net worth in 2010, they tried to say it was $5, okay? The average net worth. In 2000, in the most recent studies, they tried to say it was $100, right? Let's pair that with the fact that we're a part of minority and small business, that there is a proven disparity. This is not something I'm making up. It's not a fairy tale. There's a proven disparity with us receiving access to capital. So some of the things we have to do, ladies, is we have to take away all the excuses. While I'm talking to our members and individuals who come see us at the African American Chamber of Commerce, which you are more than welcome to visit us there, um, I tell them you need to get your paperwork together. You need to have a solid rock consulting in your life. You need to make sure that you filed your taxes. You need to make sure that, I think um, our, the lawyer Skinner was talking about earlier about making sure that you have everything in place with your business because if there's already a disparity, then we need to make sure we have everything together. If I see five members or talk to five people, about four of them are asking about access to capital. And then out of that, how many people can be funded? Traditionally, it gets, it gets a little sticky. And traditionally just means that you can go into your bank today and you can say, I need some money for my business. So if you're going into your bank today, some of the feedback that we give, I'll give you three things to take away. Number one, don't wait until you need money. Start a relationship with a banker beforehand and have those, that paperwork together when you go into the bank and start to build and work on your personal and business credit, okay? There's also resources for that. When you talk about non-traditional funding, who knows what non-traditional funding is? Crowdfunding. It's a number of things, absolutely. So basically, I explain anything that's not your bank, right? So there's so many things you can do. There's crowdfunding, there's venture capitalists, but let's speak to that for a moment. If they're saying our net worth is $100, we've got to create legacies. We've got to infuse money into our sisterhood so that we can go back and invest in each other because people invest in people they understand. So the reason why we don't get that crowdfunding or those angel investors is because typically there are Caucasian white males who do the investing and if they don't understand what we're trying to do, then they may what? They may not give us the funding. So we have to support each other. So some non-traditional types of funding includes factoring, right, that includes uh, using your invoices. So that basically means if you have a contract, let me give a disclaimer. I am not recommending any of this type of funding. It's like this. This is the way I would describe it. It's like the moment you see a buy here, pay here a lot, and it looks really like I would never do that. And so maybe it's between you doing that, buying a car from there, or walking in the rain, then it doesn't look so bad. You, you, you kind of, Maybe. So you, you, have, you have to be a rough, you have to take all of this into consideration for yourself, not endorsing anything. But so factoring and AP um, or uh, using your accounts receivables, you can borrow money based on that. You can borrow money based on the fact that your your merchant services, right? If you've had, if you use credit cards. Shireen is in the room, I'm gonna call her out. She's also a member of the African American Chamber. She's a member of CEO Chicks. When you talk about supporting your sister, she's someone you can sit down and talk to with that. There's also the Black Business Investment Fund. So I'm gonna cut it short. I have so many things I can tell you, but I'm gonna cut it short. I'm gonna leave you with this. The African American Chamber has an MOU with BBIF, the Black Business Investment Fund. And on December 8th, we are doing a loan -a -thon. And they are coming and they're approving micro loans on site. So micro loan is anything under 50K, right? Any 25K and under, they can approve internally. So you, if you have your business plan, if you have the documents that I'm telling you, and we, I can show you the criteria, you can, I can get you involved with that. You can come to get some cash, because cash is king. And if we don't have cash flow, we can't operate, right? Yeah. So there's so much more I can say. If there's more time, we can come back, but I'm gonna stop with that here. Awesome, I definitely want to give that to you. 
right, so our next question is from the CEO chick, Ms. Colino. Woo Ms. Colleen, as the founder of a thriving and vastly growing network of female entrepreneurs, when females fail in business, what would you say they may be doing wrong? I'll say this, um, wealth is on the other side of what you do not know. There we go. Okay, so it, it, it's a lack of information and it, it's exactly what we are all talking about on this panel, you know, and relationship is the greatest currency that we have. And so everything that is the running theme that is happening even here, the women empowerment and being our sister's keeper, it's so important that we have people that are smarter than us, it's so important that we have people that are of other races, that it's important for us to have the information that we need in order to grow and not be comfortable. When something is stagnant, it stinks. And so a lot of times we fight to stay comfortable. It's important for us to walk in millionaire status. Not everybody has a mindset that desires debt freedom. And so the reason they fail is because they do not have the information that they need to know, nor do they have the capacity to receive it if they did. They literally are pint-sized trying to take on a gallon. You understand? So there are some things we all have to do. You've got to get around people that stretch you. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's so important for us in our culture. We are used to the struggle. You can talk to anybody at this table. When Brittany did that demonstration, we all stood up. We all understand what it is to deal with poverty, not having enough, but loving childhood, dealing with, you know, whether it's molestation. A lot of the things we deal with in our community is because of poverty. It's because of the lack of opportunity. It's because of the lack of relationship. Some of us never leave the, our neighborhoods. And so I think it's about us gaining information, it's about us networking, it's about us understanding who we are, the value that we have, that we are wonderfully and fearfully made, that God gave us something. We look for it out here, right? But you are, you are the brand, like God put it on the inside of you. And so it's more important for you to sit down and understand, get on Facebook and get on your face. Like literally find out who you are, who you are, what God gave you. Learn how to work the mess out of the gift that he gave you because that is what's going to attract the wealth. You understand what I'm saying? Then connect with people that you compliment, honey. Y'all get together and it's like y'all burn. Like, you know, and it is exactly what we are experiencing in, in our network because I am not afraid of someone coming along that one, doesn't know what I know. Two, she's good at all, like, get out with it and just doing what she does and doing it well. We can do it together. And that is how you're going to, I don't just build brands, I, I, I build a culture. Yeah. And so that's what it's about. We want to shift the mindset. I'm not after your money, I'm after your mind. <laughs> like, please, can you think for a second? Let's be able to put some thoughts together. Let's strategize. What is it going to take? How, and this is some other thing I love to let women know when I have an opportunity to sit with them. Like, don't you just get up there and forget about your husbands and your sons. Women power does not equate to man bashing. Yeah. All right. Not at all, honey. I need my husband. I need him. Okay? And so it's important that as we are getting all this wealth and getting all this, you know, power and gaining all these platforms and doing all this and rolling in the money and doing all that wonderful stuff, that you are training your sons, training your daughters, being there with your husband, knowing how to submit to him. Yes, it's not a curse word. Lay down, honey. Get it to him. Honey. Do what you got to do. Make it right. Your ability to go after what you want and what you know you deserve 
Bird has been key in your success as a financial advisor. Today you manage over $50 million. And speaking with you recently, you mentioned prospecting clients. How important is it to have an ideal client in mind? And what are some effective ways to pitch to them? Absolutely. So you, you as a business owner, you can't just say, oh, everybody's like, everybody's who my prospect is. That, that's, that's not an effective way to reach the right people. You have to have an ideal client. That this is the person I am going after. For me, it is females between the ages of 30 and 60 who are trying to build financial wealth. She hit the nail right on the head. Guess what? Women, we are starting to control more money than men, but yet we still have less money in our bank accounts. And minority women, it's even worse because her statistic, I don't believe it's the right number. I mean, it wasn't her. She got it. I don't believe it's the right number where we only have $100 in the bank account. But what I will say is I know plenty of women making six figures that when it comes down to it and there's an emergency, they are going out and taking loans or getting credit cards to make that happen. We as a generation have to switch that mindset. So when I'm thinking about how am I going to profit six months of my business, add it up, 25, that's 125 a week, that's how many a month? Somebody do the math, do it quick. It's about 600. 500, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But I'm managing them. <laughs> 500, right? Listen, I make it grow. So, that's 500 people a month, right? But if I really narrowed it down, it was 25 people a day, I was really only looking for about three or four that were either ready to do business with you right now or I was going to chase to do business with in the future. Those were those people that are saying, hey, I'm ready right now. I need to get my, my business going. I need to do this. I need to do that. And then there were some people that said, I have a million dollars over here, but I don't really know you that well, so I'm not <coughs> trying to give you that. Well, I went after them. I proved to them I'm the best woman for the job. Right There's not financial advisors out there calling people every day. I would call them. Hey, here's a good idea. What about this stock? Have you thought about adding that to your portfolio? Your business, you know, how much did you pay in taxes last year? What if I said I could cut that in half? I was the one searching them out. So I just narrowed it down to those three or four people every single day. And again, not every single one of them became clients, but my goodness, if out of 125 people, I could just convert five people to clients a week? How many of y'all would like to have five new clients every week? I think your business is doing pretty well, right? Now, today, my business has evolved. I've got 50 million under management. I have a lot going on. My revenue in my office is between three and four hundred thousand a year. We are busy, right? So my ideal client has changed. So now, three things I do. I prospect in three places. LinkedIn. Hello. I know people I've talked about all day, but I go. I look for the VPs. I look for the head of organizations. I look for CEOs. And I go after them, I inbox them, I ask them, can I take you to lunch? Can I go up and go out for coffee? I would still ask, I'd ask attorneys, I'd ask CPAs all day long to lunch and just out for coffee. Because guess what, I couldn't afford their fee yet, right? But I, most people don't turn down a free lunch. I can afford 10, $20 to take them to lunch. So again, I built those connections. The other two things I do, I connect with other women and organizations that I love. So I've got just two women-owned organizations that are specifically geared towards entrepreneurs that I'm active in all the time. And then the last thing I do is I volunteer at a charity. So somebody said earlier, you, sometimes you can't get into those, those events. The seats at these tables are $10,000 and $15,000. It's $1,000 just to sit your butt down in a chair. I couldn't always afford that. So, next, so what did I do? I volunteered. Same very thing, just so I could get in the room with the people that I wanted to rub elbows with, right? So again, you're prospecting, you're learning, but then, I'm, last thing I'm gonna close up, as women, we gotta start doing the right things with our money. We have $100 in the bank, there's an issue with that, right? I am a strong believer, so I believe you should pay your tithe first, but the next person you should always pay is yourself. There is no reason that OUC, Progress Energy, Bank of America, they should always be the first person on your list. Why can't you be the first person on their list? Whose worth are you putting your money into? All right, I'm close it.
we're having a good time, but businesses are stagnant because we aren't learning anything. Right. We need to be learning things that we can apply right away to grow our businesses and take them to the next level. And everybody who's been a part of this event, they believe in celebrating the dreamer in you, the ambition in you, and they want to give you those tools to help you reach your next level. And so this is what it's all about. Our next question is for Juanita Coley. You are building your consulting empire by empowering other business owners on how to properly, properly set up businesses. What are some of the basics that every business owner should have in place? So, uh, when we talk about properly establishing businesses, our first, but you first need to be a, a legal entity, okay? And so, a sole proprietorship is not a legal entity, okay? So, I know a lot of times people operate as sole proprietors, um, but that's not a legal entity. You can't um, get a bank loan, uh, you can't do too many things as a sole proprietor. As a matter of fact, um, you are still liable for the business as a sole proprietor. And so uh, that's the first thing that you need to be looking into doing. I think after you've done that, uh, then you definitely need a business plan, right? You need to make sure that you're building on a solid foundation because as our business grows, right, we need to be able to look at a blueprint. And so my background is in corporate America. And so one thing that I absolutely love about corporate America is that they have plans, right? And they're all different types of plans. We have business plans, we have continuity plans, meaning if something goes wrong, what do I do? <laughs> do my operations stop? And that's called a continuity plan, right? So um, I used to work for United Healthcare and I was in charge of their command center. And that was what my job was, was drawing up their business continuity plans and making sure that if a hurricane happened in Florida, that Minnesota calls would still route to uh, Minneapolis. Or uh, if a disaster happened, the operations wouldn't stop. And so, so many times as business owners, we have this passion to get into business. We have this, you know, awesome idea, but then something comes up, you know, like Alicia told us, everything in the universe seems like it just happened to just come at you all of a sudden. And so it's like, that's okay. We, we expect that. In project management, we call that known unknowns, right? And so we know that something is going to happen, and so we build what are called continuity plans. That means if I'm a baker and my stove goes down, does my bakery stop? Right, right. So you just, you just out of business, huh? <laughs> you know, if my cake, I got a wig, and I can't get the cake because your stove goes down. No, you have a continuity plan that says, okay, I can go and rent this stove or whatever it is from this particular place so that I can still fill my orders and operations is not stop. And so uh, we have basic business plans, which is just your foundation. What is your mission? And, you know, what are the services that you offer? How are you going to price and all those different things, and then it's levels to it, you know. So then we have continuity plans, we have strategy plans, we have all those different types of plans. Um, so I would say that those are the two most fundamental things, you know. Funding without a business plan. Yeah, that just made that clear. Yeah, yeah. Right. That my next question. For companies looking to activate corporate sponsorships, what business model should they possess in order to make their companies attractive to large corporations? That's a great question. So when we talk about sponsorships, a uh, business needs to go into it understanding that a corporation is going to look at it from a what's in it for me, you know, perspective. So they have two type of types of way they're going to sponsor you, either from a marketing standpoint where they come in, they set up a pop-up shop or whatever the case is going to be, or they're going to sponsor you from a nonprofit standpoint. So whether you are, um, if you have a nonprofit, so you are a tax exempt organization. So if you don't have a tax exempt organization, then we need to make sure that we understand the lingo that we need to speak to these organizations to say, hey, this is what's in it for you. My audience is this big, or this is the type of return on investment that you will get from sponsoring my type of my type of event. And so usually we, we do that at Solid Rock. We do sponsorship decks. And usually when we're doing the sponsorship deck, one of the questions that we ask is, are you a nonprofit? Because we, we, we try and we go into a strategy session, right, to kind of figure out, are we gonna pitch you from a nonprofit perspective? Or are we gonna pitch you from a, you know, hey, this is my audience, this is, you know, what my reach is, and this is what's in it for a potential sponsor. <coughs> That's awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. No more bootleg entrepreneurs. No more bootleg bosses. We're trying to 
have got a good job of stuff to go, y'all. In case you didn't notice, so my next question goes to a millennial serial entrepreneur, Miss Natalie Nicole Smith. Now, just being 30, you've been able to um, have a six-figure earning. And I just want to know, can you talk about the, the tools and the funnels you use to become a serial entrepreneur? Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, first, I want to say thank you, Sierra, for allowing me um, to serve um, on your platform. I'm very, very proud of you. Um, it's nothing like being in a room full of motivated, uninspired, goal-oriented women. And for myself, um, to answer your question, you know, I'm just a girl boss. I decided to go for it. As you heard my story, a little bit of my story, a little bit earlier, um, usually you have to go through something in order to get to your next level. You can agree, right? So a lot of times in life, um, the word boss um, and success is thrown out there very, very loosely. Um, but for me, um, at a very young age, I realized that um, the way I looked and the way I knew how to get money but couldn't keep the money in my bank account was not bossy at all. Um, so I decided to be my own private investor. Um, I decided to really lean on God
accept Medicaid. We also accept um, fee based on child care from the Veterans Hospital. We provide mastectomy films, mastectomy bras, and prosthetics for cancer patients. Um, we also run corporate wellness programs and corporate organizations. Um, because y'all know what's going on with healthcare right now. So we do stress management, nutritional management, um, meal plans, um, and do different fitness workshops as well in corporate organizations. And I am now um, the founder. Uh, and remember, you guys, dreams always come true. I never thought I wanted to own a nonprofit. I'm just being honest with you. Um, but after being called a boss so many times, I saw the help a thousand women become bosses, first spiritually, right? And then emotionally, then physically, then financially. So I created a nonprofit called Women Be Boss. Boss stands for beautiful, optimistic, sophisticated, safe. Um, we run programs and private youth services in the juvenile jail, ten group homes right now. We run rites of passage program. We partnered with the University of Potomac. I'm getting them qualified to go to college right now. So I'm just living my dreams. And throughout this process, um, I like to connect with women just organically um, to see how I can serve them. And that's why I flew uh, to Orlando, three hours of sleep, um, to serve Sierra today. I'm going to take a few questions from um, the audience. If you guys have any questions for our power panel, just raise your hand. We're going to take about two. All right, Alicia. Um, for, for those who are starting business or are in business but need that assistance to start getting capital because it takes money to make money, what are the key things? I know you said a business plan, but what are the key things that you need?
So I'm great, I, love, I don't mind funding, I don't mind loans, all those sort of things, but again, it goes back to even in your business, you need to pay yourself first, okay? When you're building that money, some of you, and like, how many of you watch Empire? Don't tell me about it, though. I know I'm not bad on this, I got my guilty pleasure, okay? <laughs> so I love the last couple of shows, but when Cookie walks in to a bank and gets denied, and then she goes into a room full of women, and one of those little ladies says, I'll give you the money. We need to be the lenders. But you cannot be a lender if you don't get your own finances in order. If you don't get your own business bank accounts in order, you can't do that. Let me tell you, when, and I tell you, white men do it all the time, I got plenty of white men that are clients, but when they need money, you know who they borrow it from? Each other. Even, or they borrow it even from themselves. When you have money, so I just had a client call me on Friday and say, Christina, I need $150,000 and I'm gonna buy this property next week. I'm gonna buy the property next week, and I need $150,000. How am I gonna get that? All I'm doing is looking at his investment account, right? He doesn't have millions of dollars with me, but he has fully funded his 401k plan. He has fully funded um, uh, an annuity for himself. He's done a life insurance policy for himself, and he has a little other extra cash set on the side. So between all of those things, I look at it, he could borrow $200,000 against his own money. That's not traditional. Funding, right. traditional funding. Right. So he don't need to ask the bank to give him the money. He has the ability to borrow the money. And he didn't start that way. You know how he started with me? He was a worker at Home Depot. Wow. Wow. He decided to buy a business, a painting business. It wasn't that much, wasn't anything crazy, but has just built that over the last five years to almost a $7 million business, okay? And then all he did every single time, every, every month, like clockwork, he sends in a little bit of money. But now he is, five years later, $7 million in business, buying his own building, over a $2 million building, buying his own building, realized that the building didn't have enough parking space, so he decides, I'm gonna buy the two properties next to me, clear the land for the parking space. Come on, we need to make decisions like that. I, I, I'm waiting for the day where I can hand somebody $100,000, a $1 million, to say, what? I believe in your business plan. I believe in your business idea, because I know I can't get it from the bank. I know I can't go get it from the white man. I'm just being honest. I can't get it there. Those still, those things, that, that was such a realization in that show. Again, forget all the other mess. It is still a realization as minorities when we walk into banks and ask for money, we're getting turned down 90% of the time. It's a fact. And we, Wired Magazine, yeah. Wired Magazine, CNN Money, all of it, it's a fact. It's almost embarrassing, that's what they wrote. It's embarrassing that we are the leading, the number one. growing, and we, it's like 2% that we can get, but we can't get funding. But we consume. So we, we have to go back to, you always talk about building legacy and building wealth. And that way we can circulate it around. Because we can't take the shackles off if we don't have any money. We haven't empowered ourselves economically. That's the only way we can get those shackles off. And that we can turn around and help someone else take the shackles off. And when you talk about a startup, just very quickly, aesthetically, I need you to get your startups together. You've got to have a website. You've got to have an email address. You can't come and say, hey, email me at Tina at Yahoo at no, you have to get all of those things together aesthetically, and you we can't go look on sunbiz.org and we can't find you. All of those things go into play when you talk about looking for investors, funding, partners, collaboration. So I, I'm looking at a lot of people's faces and I'm like, okay, this is a lot, right? So I understand. And coming from a millennial side, um, everything big was once small. Everything big was once small. And I'm being really transparent because I would listen to these this advice. I go, wow, I'm gonna get my business credit together. I'm gonna get my personal credit together. I don't have any money, right? Two things that I did um, because I went to people. I, want, I needed my some money, for real. And they looked at my, my business account and they said, You make money. Your invoices are there, but you don't have any money saved. What's happening? You're irresponsible. Well, your credit is trash, right? So you take a responsibility right now today and say, I'm gonna do better with my funds. I'm gonna be a good steward over my finances, right? Um, the next thing I would say, and, and this is the, the guys on this group, um, but see no check out, what's your name again? Khalid. 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 Okay. I, listen, everything you need is inside of you or right around you. Go to sba.gov today, okay? I teach young people how to start business plans that are better than mine. 
stuck. They're like, well, I don't know the answer to the question. And so then they get stuck. Well, you have, that's where really taking the time to understand who you are as a business, what your why is, who your audience is. And then that, that's many times why people go to a consultant or go to someone to help them vet and build their business plan because they just know I make cakes or I make t-shirts. And so you have to really develop that business. With your car. Don't get twisted, I was broke, busted, and disgusted. Okay, 15 years ago, literally, my breaking point was I was at a gas station trying to run a credit card and could not pay for the gas. Didn't have the money in my bank account, I maxed out all my credit cards, my credit score was crap, and you know, it was my breaking point to say, I do not want to be a financial, I do not want to be a bondage any longer. And so, took some financial courses, learned some things, took the Dave Ramsey class, just got myself on track. The woman that you see today is because I've been broken. When it comes to finances, I've been broken. But today, I don't have that same fear. We have money in the bank, we have life insurance, I have a retirement plan, I manage a lot of money and I make a lot of money. But I had to transition my, it's your mind, you have to change. And that's it. it has, it, and that's with anything, whether it comes to eating, finding, you know, your weight, whether it comes to financially, whether it comes to your business, it is your mind you've got to get right. All right, on that note, who wants to continue to be an entrepreneur or a CEO or, you know, like, you still want it? Right? It's worth it. It is definitely worth it. I know it can be overwhelming, but it is worth it so that you can have the freedom with your family. You can have the freedom to travel. You can work from anywhere, but it's so important that you get around the right people and that you have the right connections and relationships. You're not going to get it all in this one setting, right? So you want to make sure that you are in an environment where you're around people that understand the language until you learn it and can apply it. So don't be overwhelmed. It's like people stop breathing, you know? It's like you can feel it barely in the room. But definitely, it is worth it. It is worth it. Don't give up on your dreams. All right, see ya.